In this video, we'll be going over the solution to lead code question number 13, Roman to integer. In this question, we are given a Roman numeral as a string and must return the corresponding integer. For those of you who aren't familiar with Roman numerals, I'll do a quick recap. So Roman numerals consist of seven different symbols and each one corresponds to a different number, as you can see on the right. Now, generally, they are written in order of largest to smallest and all you have to do is just add the digits up one by one. For example, ii is just one plus one, which equals two. But the exception is if a number happens to be smaller than the one after it. If that's the case, then you have to subtract the smaller number instead. For example, vi is six, since you just add five and one. But iv is four, because the one comes before the five, and it is also less than five. So you subtract the one instead, and 5 minus 1 is 4. It turns out that there's only 6 cases in the Roman numeral system where you're allowed to do this, and they're all listed here. So now I'm going to go over two different approaches to solve this problem, and the first approach is to incorporate the general logic of Roman numerals into an algorithm. So let's say this is the input string, s, that we need to find the value of. I've also indicated the index of each character in the string here. So to start, we know what values each Roman numeral maps to, so this will be a good opportunity to use a dictionary to store those pairs, where the Roman numeral will be the key. We'll call this dictionary Roman. Next, we'll create a total variable and set it to zero. This variable will accumulate the total value as we add up each Roman numeral. We now enter a loop and let's figure out how long this loop will run. The length of s is six characters, so six minus one is five. But since the range function excludes the last number, this loop will run from 0 to 4. Now if you look at the string, you'll notice that index 4 is 1 before the last character. So why do we stop at the second to last character? To answer that question, let's look at the next line. Here, we're going to compare the character at index i to the character at index i plus 1. This is why we stop 1 before the last character. If i was index 5, then trying to access index 6 would result in an error. So at index 0, we have m and then we look up the corresponding value in the dictionary, which is 1000. We do the same thing on this side too, except we use the i plus 1th index, so that's the character c, which corresponds to 100. So what this line is asking is, is 1000 less than 100? Obviously this is false, so we'll skip to the else block and just add the current value. Again, m is 1000, so we'll add 1000 to our total. Now let's look at the next character, which is at index 1. C corresponds to 100. The character after it is M, and M corresponds to 1000. So now we are asking, is 100 less than 1000? This is true, so now instead of adding 100, we're going to subtract 100 from our total. The total is now 900. Moving on, the next character is M, which again corresponds to 1000. And the character after it is X, which corresponds to 10. Now we ask, is 1000 less than 10? This is false, so we can just add 1000 to our total. Next we'll compare x, which is 10, to i, which is 1. 10 is not less than 1, so we just add 10. Next is Roman numeral i, and we'll compare that to v, which is 5. Now 1 is less than 5, so we'll have to subtract 1. At this point, we've reached the end of our loop, and for this last line, we'll just return the total plus the value of the last character. This index of negative 1 here is something you can do in Python to access the last character in a string. We do this because we know that the last character has to be added no matter what, since there's no more characters after it. So the last character is v, which corresponds to 5, so we'll return 1909 plus 5, which equals 1914, and that's our final answer. Okay, now that we've gone through one method, I'm going to show you another way to tackle this problem that may seem a little bit hacky, but given the constraints of the problem, it's actually a valid method. So here's what the second solution looks like. You'll notice that the first two parts are identical. We set up a dictionary called Roman and initialize a total variable to zero. Now remember how I said there were only six different cases where subtraction could be used? This method takes the approach of saying, well, figuring out when a number is less than or greater than another number is confusing and cumbersome. Instead, Let's just make the entire system simple. Let's modify the input string 
so that you only have to add each number and not worry about subtraction. So the next six lines perform substring replacement on the input string s. For example, this line searches for the substring iv and if found, replaces it with iiii. Notice that by doing this, we can now just add up all the characters, so 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, and that'll give us the same value of 4. Now, this is not proper Roman numeral notation, but it doesn't really matter for our purposes. So we do have the substring iv, so let's replace that with iiii. The next line searches for the string ix, which is 9, and converts it to viiii, which is also 9 if you just add the digits up. That substring doesn't exist here, so next we'll search for xl, which also can't be found. Then we'll try xc and cd, both of which are not contained in a string, so again the string doesn't change. Lastly, we'll look for cm, which does exist here. cm is 900, so let's convert that to dccc, which is 500 plus 100 plus 100 plus 100 plus 100, which equals 900. Now that we've converted the string to follow our new system, all that's left to do is just loop through the string and add each number to the total. We'll set up the for loop where numeral will be each character. Notice here I don't need the indices, just the character itself. We'll then look up the character in the dictionary, m corresponds to 1000, and add it to the total. Next, d is 500, so now we're at 1500, and we'll continue this until we've looped over everything. Now we just need to return the total, which is 1914. Notice that we got the same answer as the other method. Now let's compare the pros and cons of both methods and see when you'd want to use each one. So for the first method, one of the pros was that we didn't have to modify the input string at all and we didn't have to traverse the string over and over again to replace substrings. This method also incorporated the logic of Roman numerals itself into the algorithm, so as a result, it's more flexible. The main drawback of this approach is that the logic is a bit harder to follow. We had an if-else statement nested inside of a for loop, and you have to figure out when to subtract and add, so it's a bit less interpretable. As a result, this type of approach shines best when there are many different cases, or the cases may change in the future. For example, let's say that instead of just six different cases, there were 100 different cases. Using the first method, the code wouldn't have to be changed at all since the logic itself is already incorporated, but using the second method, you'd have to manually write out all 100 cases. So now let's look at the second method. The biggest pro is that the logic is easier to follow because we essentially take a confusing system and convert it into an easier system. However, the cons are that you must manually write out each case, and for each case you have to traverse the string looking for a specific substring. As a result, this approach is more rigid and works best when there are only a few cases and you know those cases won't change. It also works best if the input length is short because of the repeated substring search. So which approach is better? Well, that really depends on the details of the problem. For this specific problem, there were only six different cases, and if you look closely, the input string was limited to only 15 characters. So although method two seems much more rigid, Given the details of this specific problem, it's actually a very valid way of solving it. On the other hand, method 1 also worked just as well, and although it's a bit more complex, in a similar type of problem where the input size wasn't capped, or there were many more cases to write, we might be able to say that method 1 would be better. The point I'm trying to make here is that there are always trade-offs to every type of approach, and so the best solution really depends on the details of the specific problem at hand, and what's more important than just writing a solution is being able to explain how your solution works and why you believe that your solution is the best one for the problem at hand.